l'aspettavano così? Perché credo in quello che dico. Questo è basta? Sì. Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza e tutti colpiti da una curiosità sospendono per un istante d'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido. aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo è basta? sì Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo l'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza sospendono per un istante d'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido. civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. Grazie, benvenuti a questo. Good afternoon and welcome. The title of our event is Free to Educate in the Schools of the World. This event will see the participation of three people responsible for educational projects from three different geographical areas and they have worked in the training proposals of the association diesel ds and cdo that also support our event and i will then introduce them now luciana cardarelli from canada mother teuta sister teuta buca from albania and Hans van Morik Brockman from the United Kingdom. I must say they are three friends. Uh, they are here at the meeting for the first time. Uh, they are uh, uh, really happy and to be here. And uh, I now 
ask them to tell us about their experiences. And they will talk about the fact that education is, by definition, the passion for a person, the individual that asks for the education to have a certain perception of himself and the opportunity to love the opportunities that other people have. And this is what is at the basis of the educational event. So we would like to talk about education as a value that is fundamental for a social sustainability and also to see how the educational system of Father Giussani make it possible to meet the educational needs of the young of today and to verify uh, the uh, potential of uh, educational networks uh, in the world. So I'll start uh, with uh, Luciana Caldarelli. Well, uh, she obviously has uh, Italian origins and she is coordinator of uh, uh, the training programs uh, for uh, principals of the Catholic Principal Council of Toronto in Ontario. This is a network of uh, 2,500 uh, principals of Catholic schools of different uh, levels. So she is an expert in uh, training, in coaching, and in managing uh, the uh, educational sectors. Uh, she has uh, skills in terms of uh, negotiation and uh, uh, educational techniques and uh, she graduated at the University of Toronto. So I will have a few questions for each of our guests. Let's see what they will answer. What does it mean, Luciana, to coordinate a web of over 2,000 Catholic schools in a place like Ontario in Canada, which is a country marked by a secularist culture? And what are the inspirational principles of a web of schools. Grazie. Today, I uh, have been in Italy since uh, the 13th of August. E parlo italiano. E infatti, devo pensare un momento per sentire quale lingua vada dentro la. I have to think a moment before I decided to speak either English or Italian, but uh, I'm uh, very happy to have uh, uh, the interpreters here today with us. Okay. And Grazie. And the Catholic Principals Council of Ontario represents 2,500 members across the province of Ontario. And to give you a sense of what that means, Canada's population is 40 million, Ontario, 17 million, and the greater Toronto area, 7 million. Our area is about three times the size of Italy. So Ontario is a very large district with many, many diverse needs. Within my role, it's uh, very interesting and very challenging to bring forward Catholic leadership formation that meets the needs of the many diverse areas and the many diverse people. In fact, in Ontario, starting in the 1960s, the presence of ordained people and sisters in our schools has declined tremendously. In fact, today, less than 1% of principals and vice principals are ordained people. The vast majority are lay. And so, whether it be our teachers or whether it be our administrators, that notion 
of committing to formation over the length of their careers is absolutely essential. We are lifelong learners, be it with respect to pedagogy or be it with respect to our faith. And in fact, it's my work to lead this formation. This, of course, is within a very unique context of Ontario, where we have four sectors within government-funded education. Catholic English, Catholic French, Public English, and Public French. And so there is a tremendous competition for the best people and the best students when it comes to our schools. What has been constant for us throughout all this time is the necessity and the moral imperative to absolutely be able to tell our story as Catholic leaders and Catholic students. Through our words and through our actions, it becomes critical that we distinguish ourselves from other schools. We've been able to achieve this through embedding our faith in every element of pedagogy, every element of community, and every element of that proclamation of our story. It means great collaboration with different partners, such as our unions, such as our collaborative associations, our professional associations, and collaboration with uh, um, areas like public health in terms of supporting our students. At the end of the day, our work is to enact the principles that Christ has taught us and to lead by his example of teacher and leader. When I think about our inspiration in terms of our own association, there are three words that come to mind. Serve, advocate, and lead. When it comes to service, it becomes extremely important to be sure to meet the needs of our students and even our families. And this could be something that might be a bit of a different perspective on things. But we need to realize that if we are serving our students, we need to go to the experts of those students. And those experts, of course, are their parents. And so working together with parents, we're able to then bring forward the best possible conditions for that student's success. In terms of advocacy, again, bringing forward student needs, bringing forward teacher needs, and bringing forward principal and vice principal needs to those who need to hear them. People like uh, at the government, people at the ministry where we work towards terms and conditions for our, for our membership, Again, with our health partners, where we seek to meet the needs of students with physical needs, intellectual needs, or psychological needs. And of course, working with our parish partners in supporting the growth uh, of faith with regards to our students and our families. The notion of leadership is absolutely essential to our membership. And that therein lies the work of professional development, both in terms of pedagogy, leadership, and faith. With respect to the needs of the students within our schools, I ask you to think about the needs of your society, of your communities, because in fact, it is the needs of our communities that are reflected in our students. Our schools are inclusive. Our work is to absolutely make possible success and growth and getting to know each child so that they can reach their God-given potential. The quest of Catholic principals and vice principals is to know each child by name, as Isaiah would have said to us. Because that whole idea of understanding the true story, understanding that perhaps the outburst of a parent comes by way of a, a part of their journey, which might have impacted how it is that they engage with schools today, makes possible the opportunity to find success, to find ways of making our communities stronger.
Sorteu Tabuka. Sister Tay Tabuka was born in Scutari in Albania in a poor family, and she was persecuted by communism as she wrote in her own bio. In 1991, after the fall of communism, she knows for the first time so the solution and uh, decides to become a nun and to to the solutions and uh, to become an educator and uh, she was a director of uh, the oratory of scutari and the high school of mazzarello and now she's directing the maria mazzarello center in tirana since 2010 she has been uh, a national coordinator of uh, the National Commission for Catholic Education, which encompasses a network of around 60 schools. Her academic studies uh, were enriched in the areas of spirituality, pedagogy, and educational management. And she, my question for her is the following, considering that she wrote about herself that the thing that she considers extremely valuable is the daily contact with the kids and uh, young boys and girls of different ages and uh, the contact with my colleagues. This has been the best school ever for me. So, Sister Tota, where does this passion come from? And uh, the request for attention, education and truth uh, for uh, young people uh, expresses in Albania. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful opportunity. I feel honored and I feel very much welcome. And this is the first time I come here. I always had a look at what happened in Rimini from a distance, but it's really great. And it's a great opportunity also to share an experience, uh, even if my experience is pretty limited and small. And uh, so uh, as an ordained educator in the 90s, after the fall of communism, together with some uh, other young friends, uh, we that were faced with something new, something that had never existed before, because uh, we were asked to make uh, our dreams come true somehow, because during the dictatorship, everything was uh, perfectly set, and uh, we had to hide our dreams from the government, so nobody could step off somehow. But then uh, we had, uh, for the first time in life, uh, to have the opportunity to make our dreams come true, and uh, that marked uh, such a change. And that was attending university, and I got to know Salesians with a group of voluntary workers uh, who had come to Albania. And that great sharing, uh, praying uh, opportunity based also on joy, well, let uh, some sort of uh, desire grow in me because I thought, uh, what can I do? I'd like somehow to do something more. For the first time, I saw the opportunity to do something that I really loved in life. So I had the chance to see how the Salesians were somehow experiencing educational activities. So I suddenly uh, thought that I could follow my vocation somehow, but that was just the beginning because it took me some time to reach where I got. So my religious education and my educational training went somehow hand in hand because I had a chance to stay with the young people and I understood how to educate them and to share my dreams with their dreams because my dream was to educate them. And so the, the, the young people in the classes were my best training ever with their needs, with their also requests. They somehow 
uh, were asking me to be an educator. I was not even 50. And that was a, such a, a great, uh, I mean, uh, school for me on the ground, so hands-on, and thanks to that, I had the chance to understand what does it mean to be an educator. You need to be there, sometimes to be silent, to pray, sometimes also to feel frustrated because you don't have the answers and you don't know how to answer. Well, all that was such a great learning, and thanks God, uh, Uh, young people are my best training ever. And young people keep changing on the one hand, but on the other, they are always the same through generations because, well, needs change, uh, opportunities change, but at the same time, each young person uh, holds a certain set of values, a wish for truth. Uh, and that has some needs. What I see now is that uh, today's uh, youngsters not always uh, find meaningful adults uh, taking care of them, do not find adults that uh, want to take them by the hand and be there for them in their life. In Albania in particular, um, adults, including me, maybe did not have enough time to think over things and to reflect on our uh, pathways because we shifted from dictatorship to a completely different setting. And uh, we tried to take a plunge and make our dreams come true. So maybe we did not work through what we lived. So maybe today adulthood is in a crisis, not uh, being young. So maybe we should uh, uh, try to get more insight on what we went through and maybe learn more from young people, learn from their wonder, learn from uh, their some times a big thinking approach and not stopping in front of obstacles. So this adulthood crisis means for Albania a lack of a needed reflection. So there are maybe in other parts of the world similar situations. So where adults are in a crisis because uh, they try to hold on to some privilege and uh, are not able to somehow listen to the teachings they can get from young people. That's why I say that uh, uh, young generations share similarities all through generations, and we can improve as adults for them and from them. And now I'm introducing our friend Hans. He was born close to New York from Dutch, to Dutch parents. He attended high school in the U.S., graduated with a degree in classics from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and began his educational career first as a lecturer and headmaster of a number of Catholic schools in the U.S. and then in Liverpool, where he now heads the prestigious Liverpool College one of the city's oldest institutions. In 2015, he managed to convert the college's charter from an independent school to a, an academy that is a specific kind of school in the UK, a state-funded academy, making access to an education of excellence. And uh, normally in the UK, only the wealthiest uh, young people can attend the school, but now no longer. So a minister in the Blair and Brown government said that maybe perhaps that was the biggest breach in the Berlin Wall dividing the private and state sectors of education. And uh, just by accident, it came through the figure of Don Giussani and uh, he was somehow struck by what he wrote about education. And that's how he went back to his face and changed the school so radically. He wrote a bio, a biography, 
in the lockdown year when he said, I didn't have much to do. It's confessions of a headmaster, of a principal, and here he writes about his way of being a teacher and principal in the light of the educational risk. So my question is, what did you discover and what changed so the encounter with the educational risk? Well, thank you, Ezio. I have to be honest uh, with, with everybody here. It's completely extraordinary for me to look at you. Um, uh, if you had asked me where Rimini was uh, two years ago, I, I probably would have pointed to Sicily. And, and uh, if you uh, had said uh, Luigi Giussani, Comunio e Liberazione, I, I probably would have thought that was a pizza and the man who made it. I had uh, no experience. So for me, uh, being here two years uh, after the first time I heard his name uh, is, is, is a little miracle. A little context, I, I am the head teacher of uh, Liverpool College. Uh, the school is 180 years old. It uh, has 1,700 pupils, uh, 250 employees, teachers and other staff. And uh, as Ezio explained, uh, since 2012, pupils of all backgrounds uh, can come to the school. Uh, it is not a uh, school with any particular religious uh, orientation. I, I always like to tell people that uh, my Muslim pupils are the only ones that believe in God. Um, <laughs> during lockdown, I was lost because uh, I had been a head teacher for 24 years and I I didn't know what to do with myself, and so I played on YouTube until I found a video from uh, Father Albacete, who I had heard around the time of 9-11, talking about uh, religion, really. And one sentence in this long video, he mentioned the name Luigi Giussani. And uh, I bought the book, The Risk of Education, and I was struck. It was like uh, lightning. Uh, here was, at a very personal level, a complete anatomy of my desire to educate. And, an explanation of everything that I had wanted, had worked for, believed, and could never find the words for. So I did in fact read his 1400 page biography, and that was a bit boring to be honest. Uh, time. <laughs> and uh, and I began to read everything about him. And everything he ever said about education. And here was somebody who understood. Who, even in translation, could communicate a passion. A passion for humanity. A passion for people a passion for, for freedom. And this made me realize what I had been doing, and it also made me realize what I had to do in the future. 
and it made me throw into the rubbish bin everything that the government sent me every single day. <laughs> Three things especially I discovered. Totality in education. The idea that education is literally about everything. And I knew that, but I was working in a system and in a paradigm that cut out and systematically annihilated any non-scientific, uh, non-measurable uh, thing. And I was working in a positivist uh, nightmare uh, factory. The, the second thing was the uh, Jazani's emphasis that there has to be an hypo hypothesis about this totality, that to educate, you need to give somebody to something they can verify, something which is part of their life, something which they can be against, something which they can be for, something which they can argue about, think about, talk about, as it affects everything. And I don't think my school provided that. And I could see that that harmed the people that I was trying to educate. Finally, freedom, the, the risk of freedom, understanding and teaching children what freedom really is. Not license, not I get to do whatever I want, but the response of my humanity to the other and to reality. So this is what it did personally, but what changed in the school? Well, well, the, the, the first important thing that happened was I became a member of the CL community in the Northwest of England. And I, I, lear I learned a lot about great Italian food. And I found a friendship that, that could continue to feed me and sustain me as I tried to change the school. Then I wrote two books, which Ezio has mentioned. I rewrote completely the religious studies textbooks in the school. We started a publishing house. We uh, produced a podcast called Imagination in Education. Where we, without mentioning his name, asked celebrities and other famous people what they thought about Jasani's ideas. Then we changed the school day so that we would have a lot more time for friendship, for reflection, to open up that possibility. And then finally, uh, we rewrote the philosophy of the school. It doesn't mention the mystery or Jusani. But if he could read it, he would demand the copyright and he would demand a lot of money. <laughs> uh, because it is an attempt to introduce his ideas into a non-Catholic British school. 
These are just schemes. The just plans. Uh, the most important thing is that he, he changed the way I look at my pupils and at my colleagues. Bella. That's really beautiful. Lutana, in uh, 2020, the Pope launched the Global Pact for Education and he wrote, never before has there been a need to unite efforts in a broad educational alliance to form mature people capable of overcoming fragmentation and opposition and rebuilding the fabric of relationships for a more fraternal humanity. So. What does this statement say to you, to your experience, to your association, since you support and organize educational realities? And how has your responsibility as a coordinate, coordinator changed uh, following these indications? To put my needs behind those of others. The idea that if I am a positional leader, my success is measured in your success. And so my work becomes creating those conditions so that you may achieve your greatest possible success. And when you think about that as a school leader, as a principal, as a vice principal, or as a headmaster, and you think about it from the perspective of a student or a colleague or a parent, the possibilities become endless in terms of how it is that we can strengthen our community. I've been thinking a lot about the theme of this conference, una passione per l'uomo. If we twist that a little bit and think about it as a passion for the learner, the person who is learning, be it myself, be it yourself, be it your students or your families, and you put them at the center of everything that we do, it is transformational. In Ontario, I've seen this happen in schools. When the student becomes the heart of everything that we do, anything can be possible because relationships are created, community is created, we understand the other with new eyes and new ears. And then I can devote my energies to enabling their success. There's been theorists who have greatly helped us in this work. And in Ontario particularly, people like Michael Fullen, Andy Hargraves, Stephen Katz, have been people that we have leaned on heavily to help guide this work. They've brought to us the necessity to look at research and evidence-based practices to inform our leadership and inform the work that goes on in our classrooms in terms of changing pedagogy. From that perspective of leadership, thinking about our work around student achievement and school improvement through a formal process that allows everyone to engage has made a significant difference. And it, in fact, has been a huge support of success in terms of Ontario data. Very quickly, we look at it through a lens of assessing the current needs of our students, collaboratively uh, developing a plan that will address those needs, a plan that includes strategies and pedagogies that are evidence-based and not merely happenstance. With the implementation of that plan comes the heavy work, but what makes it light is the fact that we do it in collaboration with colleagues and leaders are in the middle of all of that. As principal, I put aside my title, I come out of my office and I work in the hallways and in the classrooms supporting students and teachers so that the success of all can be achieved. As we're working through that implementation phase, 
We are constantly looking for indicators of challenges and of success. And when those challenges come up, again, we collaborate and refine the plan so as to overcome those challenges. Upon the implementation, of course, we then review and evaluate the success of the plan. And this, of course, can become an authentic form of celebration that further develops relationships, that further builds friendships, that further builds that professional network that's absolutely essential in our work as educators. And then the process starts again. Assess what those needs might be, develop a plan, implement that plan and revise it as needed, and evaluate. As a principal in this school, I saw student results climb incredibly. And even looking at student success through a lens of demographics that take into consideration race, language, poverty, we were successful in closing the gap between those who would be privileged within our societies and those who are disadvantaged within our societies. When I think about Ontario today, our greatest challenges lie within the area of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Our data shows that students, especially those who are Black, those who are Indigenous, are being left behind, and that systemic racism does exist. And so my work as leadership development for the Catholic Principals Council of Ontario is to help principals and vice principals begin those moments and those points of self-reflection to instill greater self-awareness so that we can become more aware of the lenses that actually taint the work that we do, that perhaps let us not fully understand what the reality might be from the perspectives of those people who have less advantage than me. And to consider, in fact, that my position as a white female in Ontario, that privilege that can come along with that can actually provide disadvantage for others. When you start thinking about the two sides of that coin and you really start to consider that from a perspective of leadership, it becomes imperative that we begin to work differently, that we again put our passions towards the attention of learners and ensure that students are always at the center of everything that we do. Considering Michael Fullen, I believe that his six competencies have been very, very important for us uh, within our experiences in Ontario. He looks at things like character, that is to say, the morals that you bring to your work. As Catholic educators, this is music to our ears. We know what good morality is. We know what the moral imperative is for our work. He speaks of citizenship, the idea that we must work towards something greater than ourselves, ways of working so that the community, the greater good, benefits by our work. Collaboration. I don't believe there would be anyone in this room who would say that without collaboration, we cannot achieve anything, especially in a time where resources are becoming less and less and the needs are becoming greater and greater. Working together is the only way that we can succeed and stay healthy. Communication becomes essential. How many times have we been foiled? Have we failed because intention and impact did not match. That notion of developing skills of communications in order to build relationships, in order to reach out, in order to bring into the fold those who are marginalized. And of course, critical thinking. We cannot any longer in 2022 simply look at what is presented in social media or on television and accept it as truth. We must consider things through a lens of critical thinking in order to ensure that we are working towards that common good, working towards the society that Christ would have us be part of and to work towards the messages and the principles of our faith.
Grazie. Hans. Hans. Hans uh, wrote uh, another book entitled uh, Full Life Letters to My Students. And here he collects all the advice, the pieces of advice he gave parents and students uh, over the years before he came across uh, Father Giussani's uh, thoughts. And he explains how and why he was wrong and where, without even realizing it, he said the right thing. I find it a very um, original approach. So this is the theme of the mistake, the theme of uh, the good we want to do as uh, headmasters, as teachers towards our students. So the good in the educational act and the theme of the gaze, of the look, because uh, if... Uh, um, you admit your mistakes, that means that you can look at yourself and you can do that in comparison with someone else. Hans, you talked about uh, the, the, this aspect linked with the gaze. Can you say something more about this idea of a mistake and what is the good in the educational act and what is this uh, gaze you talked about before? Mm -hmm. When uh, I think of what head teachers try to do, I'm uh, reminded of, of a, a quotation from the poet uh, T.S. Eliot. Not quite Leopardi, but also very good. <laughs> and. Uh, He says, man constantly, and I'm going to substitute in this quote for man, head teacher. Head teachers constantly try to escape from the darkness outside and within by dreaming up systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. So I spend my days thinking of even better ways to control my students. But this is not possible. I, I, I think fundamentally my meeting with Giussani was a, a moment of recognition of futility. Uh, head teachers, human beings, they want to remove the risk of freedom. And I see this tendency over and over again in educational practice, especially uh, in the United Kingdom. There's a belief, uh, it was already discussed in Plato's Protagoras, that you can teach people to be good. The, our government ministers in education believe that if we spend more time telling children what good is, they're going to be good. But that's, think of your own experience, as Giussani would teach us. It doesn't work that way at all. It's uh, words on the wind. It's all it does is it creates moralism and then some activism of a kind of superficial kind. The, o the only thing that has ever worked in schools is the gaze of a person who loves me, who addresses my humanity, my freedom, and presents to me the possibility of a relationship through 
a meeting with a person who, who shows me, who uh, makes real to me something transcendent and positive about reality through such a person my affectivity is awakened I wake up and then I'm ready to learn and then I'm ready to listen and then I'm ready to grow this is education and unfortunately this fallacy of uh, endless I, maybe you were spared this in Italy but in the United Kingdom we have ever more lessons about how to be good there are more and more lessons about how to be good and uh, I, I hope my pupils don't find this uh, on YouTube but it's all a waste of time <laughs> It's, it's not going to make them good. It's what, what makes um, that, that gaze, that, that, that gaze of love, love for the freedom of another, wanting what's best for another person and allowing teachers to educate that uh, and, and to, to, to talk about that. If you think about your own education, whether it's your parents or your teachers, it was the beauty of that gaze, of their love and their care for you. That's what inspired you. That's what made you learn. That's what made you have the confidence to learn. Because learning can only happen when someone is certain of something positive. And a child, particularly, can only be certain of a, of a positive love. This, I knew, I knew that, I knew implicitly, I, intuitively, and from my own experience, I knew that this was true in education. I, I knew that in all the schools where I had worked, the only thing that ever really worked was a relationship like that but it was never talked about there were lots and lots of systems and theories ideologies really and not enough time and not enough honesty was spent on this fundamental sine qua non so father Giussani made explicit for me and made explicit in our school and in the vocabulary of our school something which is not explicit in schools at all at least not in the United Kingdom and what it also meant is that we recognize there is a communitarian aspect to this gaze Because it's when I see my colleagues have this gaze, that's what inspires me. That's what creates the unity which makes the school great. And to recognize it, you've got to talk about it. You have to say to each other, I, I recognize this in you. I see your look. I see your gaze. That's what makes a great school. This is very, very difficult. There are no books that you could take into a school because if you took Giussani to everybody, they would say, now what? But it is true. It is true. And that's where we have to start.
Grazie. Thank you for being so effective and uh, smart and uh, reminded us of this gaze that is so important. Sister Teuta is also an event organizer. Well, she's a real sister and uh, she organizes events of different kinds for young people, adults, families belonging to the network of Catholic schools she represents at the Ministry of Education in Albania. And she also represent, represents Albania from an official point of view when it comes to the Catholic International Organization, the International Catholic Education Organization that uh, has its premises in Brussels. So you also have an in, some, kind, some kind of international experience in that respect. So I would like to know more about the main educational challenges that are outlined at the international level, and also which is the educational passion that motivates teachers in different countries all over the, around the world, and considering adulthood, Adulthood, it's such an interesting term. Well, are there possibilities for new generations to come across meaningful adults and then be intrigued and inspired by these figures? But let's start with your international experience. Well, I would like to start from the Global Educational Agreement and uh, the Pope uh, somehow tried to outline some uh, key uh, points. Uh, one of those points is about uh, educational challenges. He talked about a real educational catastrophe that is underway, and he says that uh, families should be seen and considered as the first uh, and the most important uh, educational subject and player. I think that this is particularly relevant. Uh, certainly, there are many educational challenges today. There is a technological challenge. Uh, and technology is evolving at such a rapid pace that uh, somehow uh, involves young people in the spiral of speed. And let's not forget the social media that are a constant source of destruction. So attention is constantly fragmented as well as knowledge. But maybe one of the greatest commonality uh, all around the world is this estrangement of families when it comes to education. And uh, the Pope uh, talked about this because this is very relevant. Uh, and uh, families uh, need uh, some kind of orientation of any sort in uh, the education of their children. But that does not mean that the educational entities should replace families when it comes to their roles and when it comes to their rights and not just duties. And there are educational proposals that somehow try to flatten down educational approaches. So this is the biggest challenge certainly at European level, if not an international level. So there's a growing trend about uh, somehow flattening out uh, educational offers and uh, also at uh, offering only state-based educational pathways. But uh, this is not certainly the one and only right answer. Well, as far as Albania is concerned, well, we are not particularly concerned by this kind of approach because our system, I know that the word system is not always positive and good, but I mean, in Albania we had a regime, so there was a system coming straight from top, from the state, and so we are we have never been too 
happy about what came from the state. Well, but then we have other states, with other countries, with other situations where such impositions are presented in a nicer package, but the answer is in the same. So please bear with us with this challenge. Try to take up your responsibilities and try to talk to state representatives when it comes to educational pathways and the educational offer. As a representative of Catholic schools and institutions, I think that we should keep our voice being heard to make a difference. We are not the only educational offer, but we need to be there. It's a good way also to make educational offers at large evolve. It comes about uh, transcenders and uh, true authentic relationships in uh, schooling settings. So. I think this is key to keep the debate alive, and uh, maybe this is a challenge that has not to do only with Albania, but with many realities, according also to, uh, uh, to what I hear from friends at the European Commission. And um, when talking to Ezio, we talked about these uh, conference today and I thought about the educational experience of our young people in Albania and again maybe my own experience is pretty limited and small but I must say that every time we talk about education and school uh, our young people are always uh, a little bit discouraged and disappointed so uh, I mean what What's the source of disappointed? Well, they say that they don't like the assessment, the judgment, because they say we are not just numbers. Maybe some young people applauded spontaneously. They say, they say we feel being measured constantly. There are these uh, uh, testing standards that are so, I mean, homologated and computer-based, uh, and that makes them feel not enough considered as individuals. And then there is a sort of uh, uh, emotional detachment uh, with respect to teachers. Maybe teachers uh, lack motivation, maybe because of low salaries. But they have this the feeling that their teachers are so distant from them. And uh, sometimes they also feel manipulated by teachers because sometimes if teachers are successful, they consider the good results of the students as their own uh, success. But, so I asked them about their dream school and I was expecting answers like cooperative learning or more technology because there are also good things when it comes to a cooperative technology. They said, no, we would like an educational context uh, including people that do really care for us. Uh, well, it's self-evident because this dream has never changed across generations. They want authentically involved teachers. Well, there are no flawless uh, teachers. There are teachers taking their young students by the hand and making a journey with them. And most of all, I would say, as far as educators are concerned, and we go back to adulthood, the courage to really get to know these young people in a matter-of-fact way, because behind those faces there are people, and uh, we need to want to get to know them authentically, deeply. And uh, again, we made mistakes in the past, but we can still fix them. And well, hope. We were talking about hope and the educational hope. And the uh, the Pope said that educating is an act of hope, always. And uh, each creature, may it be a teacher or a student, has something unique, something that is unique in space and in time, and that is also determined by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So believing in the presence of the Spirit 
both for us as educators, but not only for us. I mean, we are not just inhabited by the Holy Spirit suggesting us which pathways to take, when to make a step back, or maybe supporting us not to discourage and feel discouraged. Well, young people can also have, can be inhabited by the Holy Spirit and have genius answers and genius approaches. Well, too many times so we somehow uh, exclude young people. We should involve them. If we really want to make change, we need to adopt different approaches because, uh, I mean, uh, uh, sometimes it's important to change recipes. It's high time to do that. So we need to uh, have trust and uh, be confident when it comes to the potential of the uh, of our young people. So they need to be enough involved uh, when it comes to their education. And this is part of the hope that all together we need uh, to really support and share. Thank you. That's it. We still have a few minutes. So uh, a question that was not actually planned is my a personal question that I have thought of when I listened to the examples of these three adults who are so aware, so humble, and who are able to use what they have to rebuild their schools, their uh, organization, their uh, college. So I just have one minute for each of you, please. And it is, uh, well, a question that uh, is, uh, in a way, digs very deep. What gives strength, energy, taste to your personal life? And why do you devote yourselves to the young? Because the intelligence, the richness of your interventions show that there is something behind all that. So just in a few words, what is the, what gives Taste and joy to your life, and why do you devote yourselves to the world of school and education? I don't know who wants to start. Prego. Luciana. Familia. My family, my biological family, and my school family, because uh, at the end of the day, when you work, and when you look at the love between a mother and her child, the love that there is uh, among relatives. Uh, oh, I'm speaking Italian. I'm just realizing that. I'm sorry. Well, that's a good sign. So the family of the meeting is happy. So, well, realizing that what can I, what I can offer to my fellow human beings can create better conditions for everyone. This is the, my taste of life. And uh, this is uh, what I try to teach to my children, my grandchildren, when I was a teacher to my students, when I was a headmaster to my uh, teachers. And this is uh, something that I'm still doing. Sister Teuta. Well, I've always lived my being an educator as part of my being a, a religious person and a nun. So um, I want to play my role in, in this uh, journey of the young people I work with. And what makes me happy is looking at them that they that are aware of themselves, they know what they are doing, and they are capable of being real brothers. That, 
and they are capable of going beyond themselves. So this is what gives me joy and strength. Uh, I, I think it is a um, an, an integrated desire. It's um, it is a um, it's a thrill. I think uh, to be with young people, uh, whether they're your children uh, or the children in school or children you know. And to 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 see them, to see to see their joy, to see their hope, to see them thrive, to see them live, and to see their growing awareness of their own humanity and of their dignity and of their potential to build a new world. And for, for this reason, ever, there is no bad day at school. Because this story, this story is not a linear uh, trajectory. It's a story that I need. I, I need it. I need them as much as they need me. Because being with them inspires me and gives me hope and makes me me. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this thrill. And uh, thank you for uh, all of the suggestions, the very uh, smart indications you gave us. Uh, you gave uh, us as uh, parents, as headmasters and teachers. Uh, we will certainly value them. So we need it, it, educating means uh, making it something implicit, explicit. So I would really like to thank you all. I'd like to thank our audience who followed us this afternoon. The meeting is based on everyone's contribution. It's always been a cradle of culture, and every one of us can contribute to this success. You will find around the fairgrounds, the stations and desks, Dona Ora with the red heart as a logo, so please donate at these desks, as you will see the volunteers wearing the red T-shirts. And uh, the meeting has now become uh, the meeting foundation, a foundation of the third sector. So those who donate can uh, have uh, fiscal benefits when they make their uh, financial statement. So uh, we need to uh, support the meeting in order to have such interesting encounters uh, like that of today. Thank you. civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo.
l'aspettavano così? Perché credo in quello che dico. Questo e basta? Sì. Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza e tutti colpiti da una curiosità sospendono per un istante l'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido. aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta? sì Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo l'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza Sospendo per un istante l'ora e guardo dalla parte da cui viene il grido.